The book of Exodus, it has been claimed by a number of scholars, can be considered the most important book of the Bible in some ways. The book of Exodus gives us the foundation story for ancient Israel, uh, what makes them to be a unique and distinct people with their account of the deliverance from Egypt and their covenant with God at Sinai. And in the New Testament, when the early Christians, followers of Jesus of Nazareth, seeing in him the Christ, the promised one, and trying to understand who he was and what he was about, they also turned to the book of Exodus, their story, to help them to understand who Jesus was. So in different ways, the book of Exodus is of central importance for both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So in our little series here, we want to look at the book of Exodus. We'll have some introductory remarks, and then we'll sort of go through the book, commenting on different sections as the storyline moves along, and then we'll have some conclusions. So when we speak of Exodus, what exactly does Exodus mean? We can see four dimensions of the term exodus. First, exodus is a word, obviously. Exodos, it's a Greek word made up of two parts, ex meaning out of, hados meaning the road. Now think of our odometer, you measure the road. So exodus means literally out on the road or going out. In classical Greek, referred to uh, processions of different kinds, military marches. A divorce was going out, an exodus. Death is an exodus. And I'm told in modern Greece, if you take the bus, you go out the door that has exodus written over it. The way out, the exodus. In the biblical context, clearly exodus, the word, refers to Israel's going out from Egypt. So secondly, Exodus refers to an event, Israel's going out from Egypt. Uh, this was an event in history of some kind. Unfortunately, we're not able to reconstruct in a lot of detail uh, what the core historical details were. Uh, that there is no extra biblical evidence, nothing in texts outside the Bible mention anything to do with the Exodus at all. They can provide a broader background, a context, but in fact, the event was important for Israel, but not for the roundabout nations, particularly Egypt. So more importantly, in approaching the book of Exodus, we have in the book not simply description, historical description of what happened, but we have what's called remembered history, Nemo history, M N. E-M-O, Nemo history, remembered history, which is a combination of original events passed on, elaborated, interpreted, uh, folkloric motifs, uh, theological uh, dimensions, and teaching. So what we have is the remembered exodus as it was passed on and in fact celebrated by the community of Israel. Eventually their memories of the history, the remembered history, appears for us in a book. So on the third level, Exodus refers to a book, the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus in the Old Testament. So the title Exodus comes from the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures called the Septuagint, which was begun about 250 BC before the time of Christ. Uh, the title Exodus tells us going out, we see it covers half of the contents of the book. In the Jewish tradition, though, the Hebrew tradition, the book is referred to primarily by its first words, Ela Shemot, these are the names of the descendants, etc., etc. So Ela Shemot. We should note, though, that the book of Exodus, in fact, is in some ways a chapter in a larger book. It's chapter two of the book, the larger book, called the Torah, or the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch means five scrolls, basically. Uh, the Torah points to the overarching unity, the instruction of God, uh, Israel's covenant story and instruction covenant with God. So the book of Exodus is a chapter within a larger book, which means that it has relationships to 
Genesis, which comes before it, and also to the books which follow, particularly Leviticus and Numbers, and then Deuteronomy, the final book of the Pentateuch, uh, depends on, in fact, and uh, sort of updates the book of Exodus in a number of, of ways. So, looking at it sort of uh, broadly, the book of Exodus is a chapter in the larger book of the Pentateuch. We can also look at the book sort of not just broadly, but deeply. The book has historical depth. It's the end product of a history, that the stories, the events, the celebrations were passed down and elaborated and expanded at different times. So what we have is the end product of a process of passing the story down within circles of ancient Israel. A classical study of the background of the book, uh, we don't need to go into detail here except to note that uh, it does have a background and it's not an even work. There are indications of different sources, different material there. Uh, particularly, there are two they call the old epic sources from the time of the monarchy of Israel, it's roughly 1000 to 587, and uh, material from the priestly circles connected with the Jerusalem temple, dating perhaps from the time of the Babylonian exile or shortly thereafter. So the book of Exodus, then, is what we'll be looking at in this talk and the next two. Within the Old Testament itself and the New Testament and in later history, we see a fourth dimension of the meaning of Exodus. Namely, it is a paradigm. What happened to Israel in the beginning becomes a model to understand later events and later happenings. So within the Old Testament, there'll be a lot of references to and developments of the theme of Exodus. And as we already suggested within the New Testament, in interpreting and understanding who Jesus of Nazareth was, the early Christians would draw on the book of Exodus as well. And then in later history, at different times and moments, the example, the experience of Exodus recounted in our book uh, will inspire other movements we might call freedom movements, liberation movements, moving from slavery to freedom. So the book of Exodus, a word Exodus, remembering an event told to us in a book which is part of a larger context but also a book which has historical depth behind it and this provides a paradigm for later inspiration and usage. If we look at the book itself uh, we can see the divisions of the book. On the one hand uh, we can see an easy two-fold division. The first part refers to the Exodus, the coming out of Egypt, and the second part focuses on Sinai and the events at Sinai, particularly the making of the covenant at Sinai. So in a way, we can say the book of Exodus deals with the coming out from Egypt and the events at Sinai. We can, however, give a more detailed uh, description. Chapters 1 through 15, verse 18, concerns the oppression and the going out from Egypt. From chapter 15, 19, through chapter 18, 27, we have Israel wandering in the wilderness. They've left Egypt, but they're not yet at Sinai. Then chapter 19 through 24, 18 through 24, we have covenant and law at Sinai. Then the final chapters, 25 through 31, Moses on Mount Sinai up on the mountain with God receives plans for the building of the tabernacle, the tent, and everything that goes with it for Israel's worship. He comes down from the mountain to face a crisis of covenant and renewal, chapter 32, 33, and 34. And then chapter 35 through 40, at the end, we have account of the building of the tabernacle. Moses had received the plans earlier. Before they build it, this crisis of covenant has to be negotiated. So let us turn now to the book of Exodus and sort of work our way through it. Uh, at the end of Genesis, the Joseph story showed how Jacob and his descendants and families left the land of Canaan, migrated to Egypt, settled down there, prospered, and at the beginning of Exodus, we're told they became great and numerous, filling the earth, in a way fulfilling the challenge of Genesis 1, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. 
God's promise of blessing of life is being manifested. However, they are out of the land, and this part of God's promise hangs suspended. And interestingly, it's precisely because of God's blessing manifested in their growth that the Egyptians fear the Israelites and begin to oppress them. So the book of Exodus is going to recount how God delivers them from this oppression. We read in chapter 1, 13, 14, that the Egyptians reduce the Israelites to cruel slavery. The Israelites groaned, cried out because of their slavery. They cry for release, chapter 2, 23. In other words, as these verbs indicate, Israel lamented. The prayer of lamentation is fairly common in the Bible. The words we just heard are cited regularly in the Psalms. More than 50 of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. My life is spent with grief and my years with groaning. For example, Psalm 31. There's a whole book called, after its contents, the book of Lamentations. Jerusalem destroyed by Babylon, all her priests groan. The city itself groans and cries out. Jeremiah will do the same. The book of Job, Job too laments, pours out his lament before God. What exactly is lament? We should not confuse it with prayer of petition. Laments a spontaneous religious response to the incursion of death in our life. And death is not simply the last breath that we breathe, but actually it's this whole realm of brokenness that affects our lives on all their levels, all the relationships. Things are broken, they fall apart, the reign of death, we groan and cry out. And the cry of lament is addressed to God. The God of the Israelites is a God of creation and life. If they're experiencing brokenness, chaos, and death, they cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God hears their cry. We know from other texts in the Old Testament that Israel knew a lamentation liturgy. That on occasions of national distress, they would gather and lament. They would pour out their lament before God. There would be an oracle of salvation spoken perhaps by a priest in the cult or by a prophet in, in the worship in the cult. Uh, perhaps a narrative of deliverance, and then a hymn, a prayer of praise. In fact, this structure of lamentation seems to structure our book of Exodus. Sort of, It's influenced by the liturgy and the way it's put together. We have Israel's call of lament, followed by an oracle of deliverance, followed by a narrative of deliverance, followed in chapter 15 by a hymn of praise and thanksgiving for the deliverance. So as the cry for release went up to God, we're told God hears their groaning and is mindful of his covenant. The God of Israel is a God who cares about the poor and the oppressed, who hears their cry. Who is this God? This is a question that Moses is afraid that he will be asked. Who is this God? What is his name? The name of Israel's covenant God is Yahweh. In Hebrew, originally only the consonants were written, Y-H-W-H. -H. The Hebrew, the early alphabet, did not indicate all the vowels. They certainly had them. You can't talk without vowels. But while the vowels are not completely certain, I think we can say that the form Yahweh enjoys a very high degree of probability. Uh, the problem comes from the fact that in the later Jewish tradition, out of respect for the divine name, they ceased pronouncing it and instead substituted the Hebrew word for the Lord, Adonai. And this custom is still followed today in our English translations. We'll read the Lord, often in small capital letters. The Hebrew text says Yahweh. Yahweh. 